of isotope shifts in deuterium stage for the dark matter. Thank you all for staying here till the end. Um, I'm excited to give this talk because this is the first time I talk about these new results. And unlike most other things that we do, where we kind of know what we expect, and if it doesn't work, we just try to make it better until it agrees with theory. Thank you. Here we have really no idea of um, what we will measure. Um, so let me start with um, one of the famous quotes from Arthur Schalow. He says, to do successful research, you don't need to know everything. You just need to know one thing that isn't known. And this particularly applies if it's something that nobody has a clue about. Okay? And what nobody really knows is the question of physics beyond the standard model of dark matter. Um, and Roy has already given a beautiful introduction. Um, Arthur Schauer also said, never measure anything but frequency. Um, I highly agree with him. So I'm changing my talk. So instead of generally searching for dark matter, we are using this proposal by Roy, uh, the seminal proposal by Roy and co-workers, and we are really measuring just frequency shifts uh, between isotopes searching for new bosons. And um, the work was done by um, a graduate student, Ian Counts, on the experimental side, and June uh, on the more theory side, and we have had a nice, very nice collaboration with one of Jay's group and this graduate student, Hongi Jian, um, from Seoul. So the idea is to use for a fifth force, an unknown fundamental force for precision spectroscopy on optical transitions. Um, and I will present result to you on measurements of five bosonic isotopes in the terbium. We are lucky, we have five isotopes of spin zero. It turns out to make these precision measurements, at least at our current level of understanding, you want to have spin zero uh, bosons. Um, and we are lucky to have five of those that we can trap and measure. We have done the measurement in two different um, D3 half and D5 half quadruple transitions. Um, and I will tell you at the end a little bit about where we're going next to do also measurements on the octopole transition, which is very highly forbidden. It's, I think, the state with the longest known lifetime, uh, where we have also now found um, several transitions for several isotopes. And in principle, we could even add neutral atoms to the mix, because it turns out we can compare neutral atoms and ions as well, as long as the nucleus is the same. So here the question is, you know, the, we are measuring, we are trying to measure a fifth force mediated by a new boson. Um, and as Roy described, this is my picture, is if some new boson phi exists, that can be exchanged, that couples both to the neutron and the electron. Um, through some process, then it can be virtually exchanged between the two. Um, and this virtual exchange of this boson gives rise to a cover like potential, uh, which is an R1 over R potential of a cutoff, which is given by the Compton wavelength, meaning by the mass of phi. So basically, um, if this boson is very light, then um, its Compton wavelength will lie outside the atom, and it uh, can definitely couple if this boson is heavy, then its interaction range will be shorter and shorter. Um, and the original very nice idea, fortunately not realistic, but what got us excited in the first paper, Roy and co-workers proposed that you could even measure the Higgs boson that way. So even a non-standard particle like the Higgs boson in principle gives rise to this coupling. The problem of the Higgs boson is that it's so heavy that its um, interaction range right, lies well within the nucleus, and therefore it's very difficult to distinguish it from regular contact forces between electrons and neutrons. But if it's in a reasonable mass range, you can measure it this way. So this is, um, Roy has already shown the uh, PRT reference. This is the follow-up paper in PRL, where they analyzed it um, in, um, more broadly for a variety of transitions. Um, so just to give you a basic idea where things stand, if you can measure isotope shifts at the level of 1 to 10 hertz or so, um, then you can basically probe coupling strengths and masses of these uh, non-standard model particles that have not been probed before by any other technique, maybe even as much as 100 times. So the idea is, uh, and Roche showed this nice pictures, these transitions are shifted due to, um, for different isotopes, due to the mass shift and the field shift. Uh, of course, we work with heavy ions, many <coughs> so you can't really compare directly to theory. The ideal situation would be, you know, you do the theory, you do the comparison of the experiment, and then you uh, find out whether it's an extra force. Um, and as um, we will, I will remind you once again, um, you can sidestep this necessity of comparing the theory that you can't calculate by comparing different isotope shifts. 
So let me go through in a little bit more detail. Um, you have seen two of these terms. Thank you, Rory, for the very nice introduction. So this is um, the sh frequency shift between two isotopes, a reference isotope and isotope J on some transition alpha. Um, and I've ordered here the terms um, in terms of importance. This is the field shift that Roy discussed. So this is basically the size of the nucleus, which is independent of the electronic transition, times the electronic wave function, which is independent of the isotope. So the electronic wave function depends on the transition. This is actually a fact that depends on both wave functions in the ground state and the excited state. Um, that's labeled by alpha, and this is the uh, nuclear term. This is the field shift. And the second next term of importance is the inverse mass shift. It's basically the reduced mass of the electron that depends on the mass of the nucleus. Again, this is the mass difference of the, the inverse mass difference of the nuclei, and this is an electronic factor. Um, these two terms give rise to, to a, a linearity. For us, this term is about a few percent. The mass shift is much smaller than the field shift. This is the dominant term. For the heavy ions, it's about a few percent. Uh, for calcium, for the lighter ions, uh, it can be the other way around. So these are the dominant terms. And then here I have written down what we calculate to be the next order nonlinear term within the standard model. Um, and this is basically the shape of the nucleus. So if you imagine keeping the nuclear size fixed by changing the shape of the nucleus, you get a slight nonlinearity. Um, and basically this term here couples to the probability of finding the electron at the origin. This term here couples with the curvature of the wave function squared at the origin, the curvature of the density distribution because it senses the shape. Um, and for us, to give you an idea, this is around 10 to the minus 6 in difference frequency on the different functions. So this is a small term. And then I added here tentatively what the term would look like if we had dark matter. Um, we know, we expect, so in this model, dark matter is coupled to the neutron and to the electrons. So it would be proportional to the neutral number difference between the two isotopes that you're comparing that I've labeled by delta AJ, then you can have some, put in some dimensions, coupling strength, it kind of characterizes this fundamental force, and then again you have a wave function factor, uh, which is basically um, taking into account that you're coupling from some ground to some excited state. Um, it gives you some kind of small shift. So these two first terms give a linear shift. These terms in general will give a deviation from nonlinearity, uh, from linearity, unless there's a fortuitous, or I would say unfortuitous, uh, unhappy coincidence where somehow if this happened to be proportional to that exactly, right, then you couldn't distinguish it because it would look linear, but it's very unlikely to happen. Um, that would be just have to be a coincidence. So as I said, you can't calculate this, and this is a large term. Um, so this is basically gigahertz isotope shift. So to get rid of it, you take two transitions, write down two equations, and then eliminate this term. And it turns out that this term is also eliminated. So if you now take the transition frequency and divide it by the mass difference, basically you take this equation, you divide, divide by this mass difference, every term by the mass difference between the photons, and between the, sorry, between the nuclei, and then you rearrange, then you can write the transition frequency, the normalized to the mass shift, on some transition beta as a linear function of the same normalized transition frequency on some transition alpha. This is what Roy was showing with some coefficient in front. The mass shift, gives you now an offset to the slide. For this, for us, as I said, this is very small. And these coefficients are basically differences, and scale differences of the, trans of the coefficients that you saw before in the previous slide in two different transitions. So this is the linear dependence. And then you can similarly divide this change in shape, this fourth moment of the nuclear size by the mass difference. And you get a nonlinear term here, and potentially a nonlinear term for the new boson, like so. And as we already pointed out, you need at least four spinless isotopes to measure the nonlinearity because you need three data points to have a nonlinearity. Uh, if you use spin, you have higher order hyperfine interaction, which by itself might be interesting, as I've learned recently. So maybe one can add fermions to it, but one has to think very carefully. Typically, um, the fermions deviate from this line. So, for instance, for us, I will show you, we see some nonlinearities at the kilohertz level, the fermion nonlinearities at the megahertz level due to this hyperfine shift. So maybe fermions can be included. But in turn, we are very lucky because we have not four but five isotopes. One of them is quite rare, so on 1% abundance. Now it's the in turbine, but we can track, uh, track it in the line track. Um, and so we have measured now two transitions. These are the two D levels of the turbium, 2 D3 half and 2 D5 half, at 4.11 and 4.35 nanometers respectively. 
we um, generate this light from a chi laser at 870 nanometers and 832 nanometers <coughs> uh, frequency double in the waveguide to get a few milliwatts of light um, that we focus on, on the ions in the ion trap, on a single ion in the ion trap. Um, and if we do that, we get um, this kind of king plot. Here's basically the units are now frequency shift divided by this inverse mass difference. So the units are hertz times uh, atomic mass. Um, and so you get a very nice uh, linear relationship between the two transitions. The slope here is 0.93 or so. Um, in the 90% lab, the slopes are pretty similar. The reason is that the D levels are pretty similar, right? Um, if this was a non-relativistic single atom transition, then these D levels would actually be the same. <coughs> it would have a slope of one, and would also have no sensitivity to any, any physics beyond the standard model. So these levels need to be different, because essentially what you're doing is you're saying there's this extra Yukawa potential, and I'm trying to probe it, so I need two different transitions to probe it. The S level here is common, so these have to be different. In the turbine, we are lucky because it's so heavy. Actually, when you change the outer electron, you also change the distribution near the nucleus. Again, you're using the same action, so this state gives you no, um, gives you no, um, signi uh, no signal, essentially. If you just took the D state, the D state we all learn has no probability to be found near the nucleus. You wouldn't expect anything else either. <coughs> this D state leads to reconfiguration of the inner electrons by a little bit, which changes the density of the origin. And so basically, with the excite here to or there, you get um, some change of the electron density as the origin, at the origin, which can give rise to the nonlinearity. Um, <laughs> if we use different transitions, which we'll use in the future, we can get about 10 or 20 times more sensitive when comparing these two. So these are not ideal, but they are pretty good, and they are easy to measure. Um, so let's talk a little bit about this plot. Roy showed it. This is from their paper. I showed it um, very briefly, but we didn't quite discuss it. Um, so what typically is plotted is on a logarithmic scale because we have no idea where the particle could lie. This is the mass, in this case in electron volts, of the, of the particle. Um, and this is the dimensionless coupling strength um, from particle physics theory. Um, there are various curves over here. So basically, let me show it maybe, there are kind of two interesting regimes. So if the mediator mass is, of this boson is less than about 100 keV, that means that the Compton wavelength is bigger than the atom. In this case, you get a constant sensitivity to, to any fifth force, because basically it doesn't matter about the range of the mass of the forces anymore. If your mass is above 100 keV, um, but less than, um, less than some other range, basically now the, now the potential is smaller than the atom. And if the Coulomb, sorry, if the Compton wavelength gets very small, the potential is very short range, and you get less and less sensitive to it. And roughly here is where the force radius, this Compton wavelength, is less than the nuclear size, and there you really lose <coughs> sensitivity. So basically here, um, you lose sensitivity for the, heavier, uh, for the heavier masses because it's more and more difficult to measure something very close to the nucleus. Um, these are here different curves. I believe the calcium curves are not correct. Um, these sensitivities are overrated, basically because in calcium, which is light, they, the two D levels are so similar that there's a lot of cancellation going on in the sensitivity. Um, we have redone the calculations for a terbium, and we roughly agree uh, with this calculation, so we believe that uh, the two terbium curves are right as well as the strontium, strontium curves. Um, the excluded regions are this blue region, so there are fifth force measurements and particle physics, which kind of exclude everything below 100 dB or so, 100 electron volt for the mass of the particle uh, very well. And then this region is excluded by neutron scattering experiments where people understand the scattering of neutrons of, uh, of nuclei and G minus two experiments of the electron. Although near this boundary, there may be some model dependence actually. It's not fully clear to me whether these are you know, kind of first principle bounds, bounds when you include the model. Um, there are some astrophysical uh, or astrophysical observations which are supposed to exclude these regions down here, uh, they are model dependent and they are actually interesting in the sense that usually you know you can exclude strong coupling but not weak coupling. The astrophysical bounds are actually opposite. They exclude weak coupling but not strong coupling. And the reason is that if the coupling was too weak, then these particles could escape and take a lot of energy with them. And because you know the energy is not left has not left, that gives you an upper bound. Um, not the lower bound on, on the coupling. But these are model dependent, so it's certainly interesting to um, kind of measure these things in the laboratory. 
Um, so what this plot shows you is that at, at the one hertz level where we are not yet, you can kind of you know, really explore new territory. The thing that really started us thinking about this and doing this experiment is, is if you could do this at one hertz, you see this gray uh, point here. This is the so-called beryllium or Tomke anomaly. Um, this was an interesting uh, nuclear physics experiment. It was a search for dark photons performed in, um, in a nuclear reactor in, um, uh, in Hungary. Um, so what they did is they bombarded lithium nuclei with protons and created excited state beryllium in this process. Um, and this is an unusual excited state in that for nuclear physics it has a relatively high excitation energy of about 18 MeV or so. Um, and it's known that this state decays via electron positron uh, emission. And um, so in general, you would expect these electron positron pairs to be emitted back to back. However, for this particular transition, they observed an open aiming angle of 140 degrees. And I looked at the paper, you know, the data really stands out. It's a six sigma deviation, it really stands out. But, you know, by naked eye, you can see that there's something going on there. Um, so you clearly see this angle dependence. They also show that this angle dependence happens only at a particular energy, around 70 MeV. And the standard particle physics description is that you have an unknown particle that flies off in a certain direction first, that then decays into E plus, E minus. Um, and then you get this opening angle that is smaller because it's determined by this initial particle. And because you know they could measure the mass and so on, they can say you know if this is this unknown particle, it would have an energy or, or mass of 17 MeV. Um, when I talk to my nuclear physics colleagues, they don't quite believe these results. Um, they, I think, the group has not you know, has had some other announcements in the past. Um, but on the other hand, nobody can point to an error in this experiment. It's really a relatively simple experiment. They create beryllium and then they measure electrons and positrons as a function of direction. So nobody has told me, oh, we think that you know, this is wrong or that is wrong. So it's, it's, a, it's a curious result. Um, and so basically, you know, we thought we would like to you know, most likely exclude, exclude this result by precision measurement. Okay. Um, so that's, that's the situation. Um, the way we measure things, uh, I think um, Roy has described it for strontium. It's, it's pretty similar. We have you know, ions in the ground state. We do fluorescent detection. We try to drive this transition, and then if the ion went either to the long the D5 half states or the D3 half state, depending on which state we are probing, then the fluorescence turns off, so it's really a quantum jump technique. Um, and um, we can measure it for these five bosonic isotopes, and we did from range from 168 deuterium to 176 deuterium on these two different transitions. Um, we perform Ramsey spectroscopy shelving. This is an example of, of Ramsey fringes on, on one of the transitions. Um, and another shallow plot, as he says, always measure twice, once quick and dirty, and the second time the best you can. Today I only have the quick and dirty for you. <laughs> Roy, I think the best you can kind of experiment. However, it turns out that the quick and dirty already re seems to reveal something. Um, so um, in, in this case, our goal was to just kind of quickly see where we are. Um, and we have some results from this. Um, so our data are really quick and dirty in the sense that we are not doing anything fancy like uh, Roy's group does, where they co track two isotopes and as you measure simultaneously, we do the simplest we can do. We track one ion, we measure the Francis spectroscopy for half an hour, we then switch to the other. So this is, for instance, 170, 170 versus 174. We measure this data point here, then we switch to the other one, we measure this data point for half an hour, we switch back and forth. Um, roughly every 20 to 30 minutes, and we collect about 40 data points, and we see a linear drift. This is basically our reference cavity. We have this high Ceph laser locked to ultra low expansion reference cavity, and it keeps drifting. And on top of that, we see deviations that are bigger than our statistical errors, and we think that this is just our lock is not perfectly good. We have some so-called residual amplitude modulation, which leads to an offset in the error signal. On that, we haven't just fixed this yet. So we see typical fluctuations of maybe around the kilohertz or so uh, away from this linear drift, but we just measure, um, make many of these averages uh, once against the other. Um, and if we do that, um, this work. okay, so this is the plot that I've shown you. This is the Dirac-King plot. If we zoom in by a factor of a million, 
sowieso into these points by factor of familiar. So the way I'm displaying it here is I'm breaking this axis. So here we have a range of plus minus 10 um, times 10 to the 6 in these units hertz times the atomic mass. And then you should think about, you know, this axis is broken by a million, and then comes the next piece here. Um, and here, um, this is for the 411 transition, same thing. Um, and so these are our current uh, data. Um, so, okay. um, so these are preliminary data. We are still analyzing error bars. Um, this is just to give you an idea where our experiment is out of the line. I think it will come out somewhere between two and three sigma of non-linearity at the moment. So we see that the data points do not agree with this linearity line. Um, and we see that typically each point is one, one and a half sigma off, so it will end up somewhere between two and three sigma uh, for the total non-negative. Um, so these are different pairs. This is the pair involving the rarest isotope, 168. Um, here it has a, a strange error bar, um, and that's because this isotope, its mass measurement is about a factor 10 worse than the other mass measurement. So the mass enters as well as the frequency. Um, fortunately for us, um, basically, the mass measurement, because the mass is divided on both sides of the isotope shift, it's almost parallel. This mass uncertainty was almost parallel to this line. So it doesn't come up, come in very much, even though it's a large, large error bar for this kind of measurement. Um, however, um, in the future, when we go down, these are measurements of about these uncertainties and frequency units are about 300 hertz, and a typical deviation from this line is about 1 kilohertz. What you see here in the frequency unit. However, when we go down to 10 hertz or below, at that point we will need to know the masses better. Um, and so we are also trying to um, get Klaus Blaum uh, to see whether they can do better. Because in principle, mass measurements, this mass measurement could certainly be done 10 factor 10 better. Even this could probably be better. Nobody has really cared to know the turbulent mass so accurately, but now we have a, we have a reason for this. Um, so we can. Um, we measure this line, the slope of this line. We have also our wave functions where we can predict the slope of this line, and we can predict it to about a few percent in our calculations. We can use um, available software factors for this. Um, so basically, this is the equation that I've showed you before. This is the linear dependence that we see. And then presumably, one of these terms, presumably this one, but we don't really know, uh, is, uh, is, a, is a long enough term. Um, and you could ask him, what, you know, let's say that we confirm this nonlinearity, what beyond it can we do um, to analyze where it's coming from? Um, and the nice thing is that we have, sorry, this should say we have five isotopes or four isotope pairs to measure the nonlinearity. So the minimum is three pairs. With four pairs, we can distinguish not only the magnitude, but we can also distinguish the pattern. And so what I mean by that is the nonlinearity could have this zigzag form that we have now, mostly. But it could be also curved linearity, where say one point lies above, then two points in the middle lie below, and these lie above. And these are two independent ways of, of having nonlinearity. And the sum of these two terms is really the total nonlinearity, but we have also a pattern uh, to look at. So we can um, look at this pattern. So basically, we define um, this is already, okay, I told you this is preliminary, so um, don't quote me on this data, but I wanted to show you where we are. So now we can look at this deviation of this point from the line in the vertical direction in this direction. I'm actually I'm looking in this direction. I drew it wrong. Um, and then we can make a linear combination of these. So for instance, the zigzag nonlinearity would be the distance, positive or negative, 168 minus the distance of 170 plus the distance of 172 minus the distance of 174. That would want to quantify the zigzag nonlinearity. And on the other hand, 168 minus 170 minus 172 plus 174 would quantify the um, the curve on linearity, and these can have both signs depending on whether the data points lie above or below these lines. Um, so we can analyze things this way, so we can do a plot where we, um, on one axis, plot the zigzag nonlinearity, this is this axis, and on the other axis, plot the curve nonlinearity. Um, and in principle, because we know what the dark matter term looks like, if I show you the, sorry about that, if I show you this equation, we know how the dark matter tail scales because it's simply proportional to the neutron number and we know the masses and so on. So we can in principle predict if it's dark matter where in this plane it should lie. Basically, if it's dark matter, there's a fixed ratio of zigzag nonlinearity and curve nonlinearity, and when we calculate for the pairs that we're analyzing, the dark matter would have to lie along this line in the graph. 
Um, if you have the standard model delta r to the 4, leading to nonlinearity, then in principle it can lie anywhere in this plane. It's just given by you know, the shape of the nuclei for the various isotopes and so on. Uh, we are now working with some uh, nuclear uh, calculation people who can in principle calculate these. Um, and for other isotopes, where well, also measurements have been performed of delta r to the 4, um, other species this can be measured directly via electron scattering. For instance, these calculations work very well, but we don't know for, uh, for uh, the term how well they work. But in principle, this term could be measured independently. Um, I should say we have evaluated what we think the next order terms are. So this is the shape term in the standard model. Um, we evaluate its magnitude to be less than what we observe. We expect this to be about 100 hertz, but it depends on the wave function in front of here. The next order term is a second order shift. Roy described it very briefly. So here you're assuming that the wave function is isotope independent and just the nuclear size changes and you evaluate you know, the interaction with the change nuclear size and the old wave function. Another next order term is the change of the wave function of isotope that then interacts with the nucleus. Um, we can calculate that term. We think that it's about a factor between 10 and 100 smaller than this term. <coughs> And the next term after that that we leave enters is the so polarizability of the nucleus. It's something that nuclear physicists would love to measure. It's the fact that the nucleus can actually change in the electric field um, produced by the electron. Um, and that term should be at the one hertz level also. Um, so this is where currently, and again, don't quote me on this, this, this data point will move, and the error bars will probably be adjusted a little bit. But roughly speaking, this is where, where our measurement in non inherity currently lies. Um, if you had pure um, dark matter non linearity you would expect to zoom in on this line somewhere, depending on, on the strength of the non Um If you had pure delta out of the four non linearity it could be anywhere in this plane. Um, and you don't know which, unless you know uh, the, the shape of the nucleus. If you had both effects at the same time and of similar magnitude, then basically it would be a vector sum of both effects because it's a sum of both effects. So you would have some displacement in this plane from the delta r to the four term and then some other displacement from the dark matter term. If I take, I didn't dare to put this point in, but if I dare take the calculations of the nuclear fourth order moments uh, from, this, uh, from this German group, um, it's predicted to be somewhere here. Um, but um, that one has to be a little bit cautious. For that, also things will lie on a line. So let's assume that you knew this here. Sorry, I pressed the wrong button. Um, so if you if you knew this term from nuclear physics calculations, um, there's still this electronic wave function. Um, and this term has a large uncertainty. And the reason is that this is uh, basically a difference between two different transitions, which are pretty similar. So there's a cancellation of these two terms. Um, and it should work to very high order. We predict a cancellation below 10 to the minus 3. But then we are not really sure about it. And this is, you, know, you need much, much better calculations to be sure that the two terms that you calculate, which we calculate at the moment just with percent precision, we, we know that absolutely calculate the percent precision. We think that many things are common mode because these delta levels are so similar, so the cancellation is probably much better than percent. But it's very hard for us to evaluate how good this cancellation is. So basically, if you knew these terms, but you didn't know this term over here, then in this theta plus minus plot, you would lie again on a line through the origin, which would be determined by the, the, these charge fourth order moments, and then some unknown factor in the wave on the wave function. So, Vlad, the the G factor is, is, is the difference between the electric field gradient that the electron applies on the nucleus between the different D orbitals. The G is the curvature of the wave function divided by the wave, sorry, the, cur the curvature of the wave function squared divided by the wave function at the origin and the difference between the two D levels. So each of these R to the four terms is the curvature of the wave function divided by the wave function at the origin, it turns out and then you're subtracting um, the two terms from the two different transitions. Um, so they are, you know, they should be highly similar and so on, but again, we don't know um, where our um, results are. So what can we do in the future? Well, no matter whether it's dark matter or something else, 
if you go to a different transition, this term should stay the same, this term should stay the same. All that should change is these electronic wave functions in front. So right now, we are trying to do measurements on the F level. On the F level, you have much less of a cancellation. So both of these terms would I expect to be 10 to 20 times larger because you have more different wave functions that are more sensitive. So our prediction here is that if we, with the new F level data, we do this plot, this data point will lie 10 or 20 times further out, no matter what the origin is. But that's, that's our prediction to lowest order. Uh, in which case, you know, even the 300 hertz that we have right now will be more than sufficient you know, to see a nonlinearity by any signal. On the other hand, you know, if, if this is a problem because the effect will be you know, 10 or 20 times larger, you know, we will clearly see or not see a nonlinearity. You know, maybe the other point will you know, lie and be more consistent with zero. So with the F levels, we can, we can test this much better. Um, in principle, there might be a small difference on different transitions. Again, if I go back to this graph, if G alpha beta and D alpha beta scale the same way, and they do mostly, right, because this is the curvature of the wave function at the origin, this is something also close to the nucleus if the particle is heavy. So if the particle is heavy, these two terms will scale the same way, and you will just get a scaled plot. On the other hand, if the particle is light, then this term will be different for different transitions, where this term will be just the wave function at the origin or the curvature of the wave function at the origin. In this case, the points will move in the zeta plus minus plane. So if you, if you have just one effect, this will be just a scaled version further out for the F levels. If you have two effects at the same time, this point will move somewhere else. Um, that would be kind of the best situation if they have different dependencies, because then by measuring many enough different orbitals, you can actually nail down the range of any extra, extra force term. So what are we planning to do? Um, we are planning, we have a measurement of F7 half on the way right now. Um, we have, you know, one isotope was known from, from literature. We have found that relatively quickly with a wave meter. We had to search quite a while to find the other isotope. This is a nanohertz, 100 nanohertz or so transition with a lifetime of um, several years. We have found the second isotope, and then it was very quick to find the third one because we used the narrative, the king plot, that holds at 10 to minus 6 and so on. Um, so right now we have found all the transitions, and kind of every, um, every pair takes us about two days to measure. So I'm very excited that within the next two weeks we have some preliminary results on, 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 these, F, on these F states. Here, we don't have enough Rabi frequency to do Ramsey plotting because the transition is so weak. We just see a Lorentzian line where we will put the line center. Again, we have something on the order of 10 or 20 kilohertz line width uh, similar to the Ramsey. So we, we hope we will see um, that you know, here the sensitivity will be magnified by factor 10 or so. And then depending on the outcome, we think we will go back to the D levels. And now instead of measuring with 300 hertz resolution, measure maybe with 10 hertz resolution or so. To really nail really down if there's any nonlinearity. After that, depending on the outcome again, what we see and so on, it might be nice to follow up to neutral turbium. It turns out that you can also make a king plot where one axis is a neutral transition and the other axis is an ion transition, and that's because the nucleus is the same. So you really don't care whether the wave function of the electron has you know, whatever 98 or what is it? I forget now. What is it? Z equals 70, maybe 70 electrons or 71 electrons, doesn't matter. So um, we have also a neutral atom clock experiment. So one could, for instance, measure the isotope shift on the clock transition for neutral turbine for these bosonic isotopes and then generate another plot. That one will actually have the largest sensitivity because, let's see, yeah, in this plot here. So here we are basically measuring S to D. So S is common. Here we're using the difference in D. When we measure S to F, then the S is still common, but the F states, you measure F versus D, so you get quite a bit of a difference. But the biggest difference is, of course, if you have two different S states. So the neutral atom has a different S state than the ion, and then you get the maximum sensitivity. So you get another factor, two or three in sensitivity from comparing neutral, uh, neutral to ion. Um, and so um, we will see what we get. At the moment, we are not looking at the data. We are just measuring them. We are not analyzing them to make, a, make it maximally dark. I mean, we look at the megahertz level to know where to find the line, but then we don't look at the kilohertz level, but we expect um, these deviations. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thanks, Sarah, for your very fresh and recent news. So we have some time for questions. 
So Vlad, your, your measurement, you said you measure an isotope pair, and then half an hour later another isotope pair, and your flywheel in between is the block to the cavity, which is drifting linearly, but you know the linear slope well enough to nail things down. At the right. Very good. So the problem is not the linear slope, that's very constant. The problem is this scatter around the linear slope. And that we believe comes with the pound the hall lock. Um, and we believe that the arrow drifts a little bit. The cavity alignment is about 30 kilohertz. And you know, we have a few percent of drifts because we haven't done some of the tricks that people do in optical clocks, which is the so-called for the experts RAM stabilization, residual amplitude modulation, um, which you can do to the next. So the problem is not the linear drift so much, it's the yeah. fact that these points. And then you can get a dick effect, if you like, of sampling that oscillation at different times. Right, at different times. So this is really what our data look like. You know, we measure this point, then that point, this point, then that point. So this is kind of one day, and I believe these are 12 hours or so, then this is another day. Um, and then this is kind of like that. So you know, we could obviously do it much better using some of your techniques. I just have a naive question. I mean, the fact that the F wave function would be much larger than the D wave function uh, my, intuitively, you, say, you, you would say that the electron is less close to the nuclei, so then it is a bit hard to, to integrate that you, it would be a better right. measurement. So, I, I so it's, it's not a single electron transition. The yeah. charge is so heavy yeah. that if you take an electron to the F state, everything else rearranges okay. at the 10% level or so. Okay. Right. It's, it's really a big effect. You know, we have these calculations where you can do So basically, the fact that you put a you're right, if it was a one electron transition, we would have no sensitivity even for the D state, right? Because the so you know, scale is L R to the L to the plus one density near the origin. So it's really the fact that we have a many electron atom and that when you change the orbital, everything changes, including the density of the origin. Uh, but that's why we get another factor when we compare the neutral to the terbium version, which have different S states, and they are really removing one atom from the S state to the biggest state. But it's surprisingly large. I don't have to think I have a plot in here. Um, so you, you know, you're surprised, but it's simply not the same. Yeah. Yeah, the, the F state is a hole, right? I mean, right. it's not even it's, it's, it's a hole, hole and then from the core, yes, from yes. the core to the S. Right, and so it's different. I mean, that's true for S to D as well in some sense, right? But then somehow, you know, there's more of a hole yeah. for the F. So for instance, in um, and we have measured this actually, you predict, the calculations predict that this slope for the F level is actually negative. And that's because you're taking the electron out. So in one case, you're increasing the density near the origin. For the other transition, you're actually decreasing the density near the origin. This is not the core of F electron. It's the no, no, but you're exciting. Yeah, it's not neither is core. You're exciting an S. S to, S to the F, right? But everything gets gets rearranged. Yeah. I mean, we would love to have help. My student does it at the moment, but we would love to have help from people who can really very well calculate uh, electronic wave functions. Mm -hmm. no. Will you be able to? I don't know whether the the octopole transition has been observed yet. Um, maybe it has, but can you expect the same frequency error around 300 hertz? With the octopus, so it's such a weak transition, I would think the error would be larger. Um, yes, uh, yeah. uh, so first of all, it has been observed. I think the first uh, PTB it has observed in two or three places for one okay. isotope. Uh -huh. PTB was the first that one. Was they found group. Hmm? That was Pike's group. That was Pike's group, right? And then we had a follow up measurement. Um, they can already, you know, I think they can even do Ramsey. We are doing the simple, yeah, we don't have enough Rabi frequency to do Ramsey, but we very clearly see the line. And the line width of the line is similar to the width of our Ramsey fringes. It's on the order of 10 kilohertz given our laser line width. So if you have you know, 10 milliwatt or 20 milliwatt of blue light and you focus it down to a few microns squared onto the iron, you can get, you know, kind of you can saturate the, the transition in about 100 milliseconds or so. These are all conditions. And all the lines that we see, the line widths, are 10 or 20 kilohertz. We haven't looked at the scatter yet because we wanted to keep it ourselves ignorant of what is going on. So I expect very much similar to the data here um, because if the scatter is just given by the laser, it will not be a different. But we will see. Mm -hmm.
going to take a look at the value of the other CJ the sixth cycle. Mm -hmm. I think that somehow it tells you that the size of the two effects that place the rows and of the same order is it right? Um, you have to be careful. So whether you have zigzag or curve, it depends on very much on the so here we have to plot the data versus next neighbors. So usually the simplest way to think about it is to plot it against the reference isolate. And then you get a difference. So this plane looks very different. It also depends on which isotope you choose, actually. So even if you use the reference isotope, that has to do with the fact that the reduced mass is not a linear function, but has a little bit of structure in it. And so, so basically, this depends on what you do. Here, we do next neighbors for practical reasons. It gives us the largest nonlinearity in sigma. And it kind of makes sense, because we measure next neighbors. So if our reference is, say, 174, and we want to you know, plot 174 versus 168, we accumulate all the errors in between. Right? If you plot it against next neighbors, we directly measure it. Um, we did also direct checks, so we measured, for instance, 170, 172, and then 172, 174. We can also do a direct measurement, 170 versus 174, and we find the same result in our error bar. But um, yeah, I don't have the, the, the graph. I can show you. So if we plot it against the other reference, um, then it actually both terms are the same. So. In this plot, if you plot it against one reference, the dark matter line is actually in this direction. It's approximately at 45 degrees. Uh, so plotted against the reference isotope, both nonlinearities are the same order. And I have to, I would like to understand a little bit better what this is going on. What's anything? that any coupling you know, would enter into the electron mass to give you, to give you the observed mass. I think that would be a higher order effect, right? Yeah, what, what it's, a weak, it's a weak coupling, so there, yeah, there would be a correction. When you talk to particle physicists, the thing I managed to understand, if the coupling is this weak, they think it's probably not a first order coupling, right? Because why would it be so weak? They think it's probably a higher order effective coupling. Right, so it could be a second order strong coupling with something off shell that then gives you this coupling that looks weak. Um, but that's really the extent uh, of my understanding. Um, but um, yeah, I have one more plot that I didn't show you. It actually turns out that um, another place where the standard model is stretched is the G minus 2 measurement of the muon. That one disagrees with 3 and a half sigma from from calculations. Um, that one is being remeasured, but it turns out that if you this plot <coughs> and this kind of plot, you put what, what would follow if the G minus 2 was really different from the calculation, you get a line, a preferred line that lines lies up here. And it actually touches the atomic bit anomaly. So if this measurement is confirmed, that there's some kind of measurement of Fermi lab going on, which confirms the G minus 2 of the muon, then there will be kind of two effects that do intersect somewhere around here, which are both at this degree to understand more. Now you have to be extremely lucky, but you know, in, in dark matter usually you have no clue whatsoever. Here at least you have some clues that you can exclude, right? Um. I was wondering if you would have uh, uh, an atom with uh, an open shell. Uh, uh, electronic cloud, like uh, you know, uh, lanthanides like Erbium Plus or something like mm -hmm. this. I don't know if they have enough uh, bosonic uh, isotopes by heart. I just wonder if this anisotropy would kind of enhance this effect because the uh, you know the rearrangement of the of the of the electron wave function would be different. I, I just wonder if this anisotropy would kind of yeah. Uh, I, I believe so. So qualitatively, you want the biggest. Yeah. difference in transitions, and qualitatively you also want the heaviest atoms, yeah. because you can see kind of your strontium, terbium, calcium, 
happens out there. So in general, also the light atoms have a problem because there, it turns out the mass uncertainty is a bigger problem. And I'm not sure what at what level the you know even if you measure perfectly, Michael, at what level the mass uncertainty uh, would set. So something like erbium heavy. Yeah, it's many heavy, electron, but also is, uh, if the anisotropy that you have uh, inherently in the F shell open or open F shell, if you would kind of maximize, because in a way it is not. Uh, I cannot imagine that if you have some kind of uh, spherical average of this effect of the electronic wave function, if suddenly it is anisotropic, maybe there is extra influence. I don't know. Uh, yeah, you can. You could certainly measure extra effects coming from the anisotropy. That's very good. So I would say I think it's an interesting direction to look, look into. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a good time to close the session to be set up lunch and time afterwards. So let's first thank Clara. And then I really want to thank like all of you, like the speakers of this session and of the whole. Um, of the whole workshop since Monday for the for the fantastic talks and really making this work. So as you can tell my voice is kind of fading so I won't say too much which is, which is probably not a bad thing. So uh, there's just like one important point I would like to make is that sort of like, I guess Mikhail agrees so like he and, and me we are labeled somehow we carry the label as organizers of this conference so as you can probably guess so it's really like a the work and the important organization has been done by, by Hussein and in particular by Naomi. And I would like to thank like, both of them.